Welcome back. In the previous sessions, you completed basic process development. In this session, the mission is to optimize the process you've developed. In earlier sessions, we looked at the concept of optimizing, meeting company needs as well as customers' needs. The discussion related to optimizing product goals, joint product planning, and product design review were forms of organization machinery for optimizing product goals. The emphasis was on participation by those who would be impacted by the goals. Now we will look at optimizing the process. For process optimization, the key relationships are between the process planners and the operating forces. Most operating forces are internal customers of the process planners. Some operating forces are external suppliers. Either way, there's the need for process optimization. What now follows emphasizes internal customers. Where your project involves optimizing the process of external suppliers, adapt the concepts and techniques as necessary. In process optimization, the main problem is to strike the optimum balance between the work of planning and the subsequent work of operations, carrying out the plan. Planners are always under pressure to meet their schedules and budgets, yet shortcuts in planning usually result in far greater burdens on operations in forms such as incapable processes and frequent firefighting. As with product optimization, the key to process optimization is the team approach. Upper managers proclaim belief in teamwork and exhort their organizations to practice it. Yet many of those same upper managers unwittingly act in ways which discourage teamwork. They establish departmental goals and use reward systems which encourage departmental managers to meet those departmental goals. Such reward systems inherently favor suboptimization unless the upper managers establish the organization machinery needed for coordination. The point is that exhortation to teamwork is not enough. It is also necessary to provide coordinating structures which inherently favor optimization. Two such structures, design review and joint product development, were presented in connection with product goal optimization. Such structures are also useful in process goal optimization. In process design review, the design review team represents customers impacted by the process design. Its purpose is analogous to that of the product design review team, to give the process planner early warning of the problems created by this process design. Process design reviews can uncover a wide array of potential operating problems, such as lack of real-time feedback on performance or inadequate provision for maintenance of facilities. Joint process planning offers the same sort of early warning as design review. It also tends to establish team responsibility for the final plan. Such team responsibility stimulates good communication and full participation among process planners and operating personnel. The contribution to proof of process capability is considerable. Optimization should not be limited to the technological components of the process. It should also extend to the human components. A case in point is planning to reduce human error. Human beings are by nature error prone. They are unable to maintain attention 100% of the time to continue muscular exertion 100% of the time, to recall all past events, to make 100% good decisions. The increasing complexity of products and processes makes these human errors less and less tolerable. The process planning itself must now provide for means to reduce human error. An example is the ritual used in hospital operating rooms, medical instruments, are carefully laid out and counted before and after the operation to prevent 
any from being inadvertently left in a patient. The starting point is to analyze the data on human errors and to apply the Pareto Principle. The vital few error types become candidates for special planning on an individualized basis. When one worker persistently outperforms others with respect to a specific error type, it is probably because that worker has a knack, a small difference in methods which produces a big difference in results. Consider the technical services engineer for a maker of analytical instruments. His average time to install one model was one working day. Other engineers averaged five days. His knack consisted of preparing the site before instrument delivery, arranging for the foundation, for electric power supply, compressed airlines, and so on. The knack can be discovered through comparative study of the methods of the workers, the best compared to the rest. The planners can then arrange to include the knack in the technology or in the workers' training program so that all workers are brought up to the level of the best. A useful principle in planning human tasks is to provide instant feedback to the worker so that the performance of the work conveys a message to the worker. A worker at a word processor presses a key and receives three feedbacks, the feel of the keypad, the sound of an audible click signaling that the key has made contact, the sight of this character appearing on the screen. Another useful principle is that of designing human work in ways which require human attention as a prerequisite. That is, the task cannot be performed unless the person doing it devotes attention to it and to nothing else. Look at what is involved in the task of checking documents. Human checking is done in two very different ways. First, by passive deeds, listening, looking, reading. Such deeds are notoriously subject to lapses in human attention. Also, such deeds leave no trail behind them. We have no way of knowing whether the person in question is really paying attention or is in a state of inattention. Checking can also be done by active deeds, operating a keyboard, writing, speaking. Such deeds cannot be performed at all without paying attention to the task at hand and to the exclusion of all else. These active deeds do leave a trail behind them. The flight crew of a passenger aircraft uses active checking in preparing for takeoff. The co-pilot reads aloud from a checklist of actions, one item at a time. The pilot repeats the words while performing the action. The co-pilot observes. Both are in an active state. The likelihood of both being inattentive at the same time on the same item is minimized. It is also possible to plan the reduction of human errors at the low end of the Pareto distribution, the numerous error types, each of which is comparatively rare. Here the planners look for some generic remedy which applies to a wide assortment of error types. For example, office work has long had the annoying problem of misspelled words. Most of these misspellings are inadvertent errors scattered over a wide assortment of different words. Now, word processing programs include a dictionary in their memory as a means of detecting misspelled words. Some even provide the correct spelling of the word the computer thinks you want to use. The planners found a way to deal with numerous error types, each of which is comparatively rare. Similar planning approaches can be found in the factories. In conveyor assembly line planning, each workstation is designed to give the worker enough time to perform the operation under normal operating conditions. Now your job is to take each piece of candy and wrap it in one of these papers and then put it back on the belt. If one piece of candy gets past you and into the packing room unwrapped, you're fired. Yes, ma'am. 
Occasionally, an abnormality arises. An input component doesn't fit. A tool slips. Someone interrupts the worker. In such cases, the worker may be unable to complete the operation before the conveyor has taken the unit out of reach. The so-called floating conveyor provides means for workers to detach the product from the conveyor in order to complete the operation. Here again, the planners have found a way to deal with numerous error types, each of which is comparatively rare. A further way to reduce human error is to build safeguards into the technology, such as fail-safe designs. Another way is to use non-human processes, automation, robotics. Non-human processes do not have lapses in attention, do not become weary and do not lose their memory, so long as they are properly maintained. Electric utility companies send out millions of invoices annually. Each invoice begins with the meter reading, from which energy usage is computed. Where these meters are read by human beings, they are subject to human error. At some utilities, the meter reader now keys the reading into a handheld computer. The computer includes a memory chip which knows the customer's prior seasonal usage of electricity. If the meter reading is out of line with that prior history, the computer will reject the reading. Rejected readings must be keyed a second or third time, depending on how far out of line the reading is with the expected reading. As work proceeds on optimizing the process goals and planning to reduce human error, revisit the process control spreadsheet to confirm or revise the process goals. When process goal optimization is complete and the corresponding refinements are reflected in the spreadsheets, the spreadsheets are complete. The product design spreadsheet went from needs to product features and product goals. The process design spreadsheet went from product features to process features and process goals. The process control spreadsheet went from process features and goals to process controls. Along the way, those spreadsheets provided the organization for a lot of information. We'll say so long for now, old friends. Optimization requires striking a balance between the work of planning and the subsequent work of operations, whether the work is done by internal customers or external suppliers. Two principal structures for helping to strike this balance are design review and joint planning. Quality planning should include provision for reducing human error. Reducing human error in processes involves identifying specific error types, which are known to be troublesome and planning appropriate remedies to be built into the process. When the work of this session is complete, the project plan should be complete. There remains only to prove process capability and transfer the plan to the operating forces for implementation. Prove capability and implement plan are the subjects of the next and final session. I'll see you then.